Hello there, folks. Uh, welcome to another BPSOP.com photo critique. Now, my name is Robin Nichols, and at BPSOP.com, I teach Photoshop CC classes, I teach Photoshop Elements classes, and I teach DSLR video classes. Okay, we have a bunch of five very good pictures in this particular critique. So we're going to kick off with a beautiful seascape or sort of landscape seascape, uh, and this was uh, this was shot by. Um, a lady called Katerina Hilgers, and it's entitled Misty Sitsikama. Sitsikama, I probably got that pronunciation totally wrong, Katerina. Um, my apologies. Uh, this is a fabulous national park on the eastern Cape of South Africa. And uh, this part of the world is, is renowned for having an amazing coastal uh, coastal scenery. And uh, I think uh, Katerina has captured this beautifully. Now, what is interesting, she's shot this on a Nikon D750, 20mm lens. It's a fast f1.8 lens, but she's exposed it at f22 or f16, ISO 100. And what that does when it's a little bit stormy, uh, there's not much light around. What it does, of course, is extend the shutter. And the shutter speed here is uh, 60 seconds. So that's like one minute. Uh, you're standing there, hopefully on a tripod, uh, to make the exposure. And what it does is it creates an effect in the image that you don't see with the naked eye. And that's kind of exciting. It's rather like night photography as well. You don't always see what the camera's going to get. And in this case, you've got this beautiful, almost like dry ice feeling uh, as the surf comes in and it goes out and it moves around those rocks during that period of a minute. Uh, a second thing that it also does is it's, I'm, I'm assuming that the ocean is fairly rough and you know, it's going to be fairly choppy. So if we're shooting in auto or program mode and you just sort of point and shoot, you're going to get a reasonably sharp picture and it's going to look very rough and choppy, not very nice. But here you begin to get this sublime, long exposure, misty, almost soft focus effect just on the horizon line. It's just beautiful. And again, that's something you cannot see with the naked eye. You just have to shoot it and, and, and enjoy it once you've shot it. And the third thing, of course, is um, there's a bit of weather happening here. So the clouds are scudding across the, the sky. I don't know which way they're going. I kind of get the impression they're coming towards us, but they may not be. They may be going away. It doesn't really matter. But you get this kind of streaked sky effect. And I think it's great. So the combination of those three sort of features you get with a long exposure are, I think, sensational. They're beautiful. Uh, she's also sort of dominated or, or captured you know, the, the lichen that lives on the rocks in this part uh, of the country is kind of very orange. Uh, and I don't know how far it is. I haven't traveled all the way up this part of the coast, but I've seen it further south. And then that becomes a very strong kind of eye-catching color to lock onto. So this may be one of the reasons why she originally thought, I'm going to make a black and white picture here. But when she edited it, she says, um, after processing both versions, she prefer the color one. And I kind of think if I can imagine what this looks like in black and white, I kind of agree with her. I think this is going to be because of that orange in the foreground. It's very kind of eye catching. Uh, now, in terms of composition, she's ticked all the boxes. The rule of thirds, you've got a third in the sky and you've got two thirds of the landmass or rather the, the, the sea and the landmass in the bottom part of the, uh, the, the frame there. So that works very well. We also have this large solid triangular shape which starts from the bottom left and the bottom right corner more or less peaking in the middle just underneath the horizon line with this rock um, and so it's almost as if the composition is pointing into the frame with this triangle you know you, your eyes are dragged up that through the red rocks up onto this beautiful textured misty water effect um, so compositionally i think it works very nicely indeed on a negative side, the only thing that I, I'm a little bit sorry about is the bright areas in the sky. So this may be the sun trying to break through the clouds. It may be just some very bright clouds up at the back end of those those sort of darker, stormier clouds going through. So what happens in the exposure is if you're not very, very, very careful, it's going to overexpose. Now, on the internet, we don't know because, again, this is a fairly low resolution effort um, and I can't see here. It kind of looks as though it's just getting dangerously close to being just white. Uh, and if we looked at this in Photoshop, it would come out as 255, which means it's basically going to print the same color as the paper it's being printed on. There's no texture or detail in that area at all. So that's just an area that just worries me very slightly. Uh, what I think is glorious is the misty effect that she's got around the rocky areas to the left and to the right and just in front of this kind of triangular shaped composition. I think that just works beautifully. Maybe at another time you might go in and concentrate a little bit more on those areas rather than having too much of a wide, all encompassing type of uh, landscape or seascape. But I think hats off to you. It's a, it's a fabulous image. It's quite arresting because 
even though it's a static shot, it's just a snap taken at the seaside, I suppose, it has got an energy to it because of this motion that you've captured on those three layers, the, the misty effect, the smooth horizon, the sort of soft focus horizon, and the dynamic kind of shifting clouds. So, you know, a big tick. I think that's wonderful. Well done. So we'll move on to our second contestant. Um, and this, again, is a breathtaking image. Um, I love bird photography and I've been lucky enough to travel to some fabulous parts of the world where you see these kind of birds. This is a, um, I'm just going to read off the board here, it's a blue-tailed bee-eater. I was just going to say it was a bee-eater. But the bee-eater family is very big. There are lots and lots of them. You see them in Africa, you see them in Sri Lanka. They're all over the place. And they sit on wires, they sit on prominent perches and are relatively easy to shoot if they're static. But when they move, as our author here, Abdus S. Alim, has, has done, he's got an 800 millimeter Nikkor lens. I'm saying that very carefully because that is a big lens. He's got an 800 mm lens. So this is an AFS Nikkor lens, um, and he's been shooting it with the D4. And guess what? 2,500 per second, a very, very quick shutter speed. And you need to do this because these birds are incredibly fast. As the name suggests, their main diet is bees, and bees, when they're flying, don't stay still terribly well. So these bees are incredibly agile. Um, he's captured this beautifully. I'm just gobsmacked. I have to say I'm gobsmacked because it is so clear. I've tried this many, many times, and I've got reasonable results, but you inevitably end up with a whole load of pictures where the bird's eye or the head is just out of focus, but its leg is in focus, or the tip of its wing is, hey, the wrong bit is in focus. But here he's ticked all the boxes. He's got all the right bits in focus. So, you know, nine and a half out of 10, I think that's just fantastic. The background, as you would expect with a with an 800 mm lens, is just gloriously out of focus. So it's almost like a pastel hand-painted artist's impression in the background. It's just beautiful. You couldn't, you couldn't hope for a better background. Uh, ornithologically, this is also kind of an interesting picture because it's rather like uh, early painters um, in the 17th and 18th century when they painted things like racehorses. They could never imagine a racehorse's feet when it's running anything other than the back legs stretched out backwards and the front uh, legs stretched out forwards. It wasn't until the invention of photography that they realized that they didn't actually do that. So this is, uh, again, a really interesting image because it portrays the shape, the aerodynamics of this amazing bird just beautifully. Absolutely amazing. What else can I say about it? Um, I'm just um, pretty much flawed. I think, uh, you know, if this were to appear in a book, you may find, um, as I say, ornithologically, it may present a few issues because bird lovers and bird watchers who need to identify one out of a large family of bee eaters might find it a little bit difficult because they may want to see the markings on the back of the wings rather than underneath the wings. But, um, you know, we, we already know what sort of bird it is, so I'm not too worried about that. It is just a gorgeous shot, so well done. OK, so what's next? We're going to move on to this chap who is looking incredibly ferocious and intent. And uh, reading from my secret notes here, this is a photograph by Jim Ward. And uh, again, it's absolutely breathtaking. It is quite amazing. This is a Zulu trekker according to Jim, it's an African Sali. So it's a man called Winneth, and he says he's a Zulu tracker at a South African game park. So we've got a bit of a South African or a, or a, or a Southern Hemisphere theme going on here. And he shot this with a Canon 450D. So this is like an old camera. This is old school camera. Um, and it's quite an ancient camera with a Tamron 18 to 270 mm lens. So the 18 to 270 is one of those great kind of do everything lenses uh, and they've sold gazillions of them because they're perfect for travel. They kind of encapsulate almost every possible focal length you need in the one lens. Uh, and he shot this at ISO 400 at 270 mm. So on a 450, this is actually the equivalent of about one and a half times 270. So we're looking at over 300 mm, shooting at 8th, 80th of a second. Wow. Uh, now, normally, if we look at the shutter speed rule, and here uh, Jim is shooting at uh, 270 mm, which, as I say, is about 370, it's about nearly 400 mm equivalent on a small sensor DSLR camera. He should be shooting at about 400th or 500th of a second in order to get a sharp shot, in order to stop um, shake, camera shake, or even subject and camera shake. He hasn't done that, or he doesn't say in the notes here, and he's ended up with a stunning looking picture. 
So the tonality in this man's face is absolutely amazing. Very, very dark, of course, for a Zulu uh, man, very proud race of people in South Africa. Um, and, uh, you know, a little bit of stubble on the face, but the sharpness is fantastic. And again, the use of a long lens, the 270mm focal length, of course, is going to throw anything in the background wildly out of focus, which is done nicely. So there are no notes here about, you know, the kind of processing that he's done. I don't know whether he shot it in black and white or he shot it in color and processed later or converted it later. I don't know that. In my mind, it looks like a black and white print that was printed on a Kodak photo paper. And I'm talking about wet bench processing photography, again, old style, um, probably printed on a grade four, whereas grade two and a half is probably normal, whereas grade five is high contrast and grade zero is very, very low contrast. So it's erring towards the high contrast. And I think it works beautifully. It kind of enhances that solid stare that this man's doing. I don't know what he's doing. He may be sitting on the front of a tracking vehicle looking for lion, or he may just be sitting on a park bench somewhere, I don't know. But there's a very strong intensity in that man's uh, face, which is just beautiful. Um, I think that's cracking. I love the slightly off-center composition. I think perhaps, you know, it's very easy for me to sit in my office and say, what you should have done, Jim, is shot him a little bit more off-center. But I'm thinking, you know, slightly, uh, a little bit more off-center might have made a slightly stronger composition. But hey, this is a pretty darn good effort, well done. Okay, now move on to uh, number four, and uh, this is just a, a knockout shot as well. I was quite I, every time I looked at these pictures, I thought, "Wow, what's going on here? This is just knockout." And uh, we have a picture by Susan Flick, Flickinger. So Susan writes that she shot this image while in Ethiopia. Of course, um, it is just stunning during the Christmas season. So Susan has been to, I think this was, she doesn't actually say, but I suspect this is a, a town called Lalibela, which is right up in the hills in the mountains of Ethiopia, where pilgrims, Christian pilgrims, in order to avoid uh, getting persecuted, built churches underground. So if you just walk past, you don't actually see anything until you go down to a little a slit in the ground and you walk down and then you suddenly you're in a, in a cathedral or a church which has been carved from the ground down into the into the rock um, and I'm talking about centuries ago this was just a stunning place and um, the Ethiopians they go on pilgrimages and here she is at one pilgrimage obviously um, at uh, around Christmas and they're very dark very dingy places the because it's an incredibly poor country they don't have floodlights and a lot of electric lighting and here are two acolytes sitting I guess they're students they're sitting you know reading from the good book he's got some kind of taper to provide the light and uh, it is absolutely stunning. It's probably one of the hardest lights to shoot in because no matter what, you just don't have enough light. You know, you can have the fastest lens, the fastest ISO, but you're still against it because of this lack of light. So the image, I mean, if I was hypercritical, which of course I'm not, um, if I were hypercritical, I'd say, well, actually, this is not sharp. Um, I, th I would reply to that comment by saying, so what? The atmosphere that you have captured here overrides any technical shortcomings that a pedant might pick out and say, Ooh, you know, you should have done this, should have done that. I think it's beautiful. Um, it, the single light, the single candle thing illuminates the boy's face on the left beautifully. Uh, how they can read in their light, I don't know, but it, it illuminates his face. There's a little bit of a line across his face, but I think, well, it doesn't matter. But it illuminates the man on the right just beautifully as well, just very subtle, very understated, almost not there at all, just receding into that blackness, um, which is just quite astonishing. Um, and I assume that they, they are probably sitting in either in a church, in the corner of a church somewhere. And when you go into these places, there are little groups of people, maybe 10 students, or there may be a couple of pilgrims just sitting there, just praying or just sitting because they made it they may have walked two weeks to get to this place and i'm talking about across very very rugged land lalibela is in the mountains it's probably two thousand meters up in the hills in the in the rocky rocky mountains and there are very few roads there are a lot of pathways and there are very very few buses so these guys just walk there um, and here they are just praying um, in the quiet and it's just stunning it's a very moving uh, shot actually so uh susan i Tick the boxes there. I think that's very good. Um, I'm, I love it. Could you improve it? Very hard to say. You know, I, I think this this person on the left hand side is, has got like a white shroud around their head. So you know, maybe the color balance. You know, 
candles are red light and that's what you recorded. I think it would be a shame to try and make it look more natural in inverted commas because I think this is this is how you experience this when you go to a, t a town like Lalibela or, 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 or anywhere in Ethiopia. It is very primitive. It's almost like biblical times. And I think you've just nailed it. Well done. And finally, in this group of fantastic pictures, we have like a classic still life shot here. Now, this is called uh, Apple Wine Still Life by Tom Lamb. And Tom um, is not giving a great deal away here, Tom. You say you shot it using a black background paper, uh, using two strobes with soft boxes and one speed light. And, uh, you know, I really like this. It's very, very rarely do we actually see things like this, a, a still life in in uh, bpspp.com because a lot of people are, you know, portraitists and they're landscape artists, that kind of thing. But we don't see things like still life very often. So it's very refreshing to see that. Uh, one of the things I kind of like about that is Tom's, again, he's got the bottle off center, which is very nice. You know, the, 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 the temptation with advertising and marketing photography sometimes is just to be very literal and just stick the bottle slap bang in the middle so everybody can read the label and see how much it costs, that kind of thing. So Tom has, uh, has done the opposite. He's moved it off center. I think, Tom, this could go further off center. Uh, and you can really emphasize a little bit uh, more by pushing it off to the left of the screen a little bit because... When it comes down to it, uh, I think you've ticked many boxes here in terms of the composition, the lighting, and the arrangement or the inclusion of, say, the fruit in the background and the tray, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's missing a couple of other elements, and I think if you can take inspiration from things like classical painting from the 17th and 18th century, the Dutch masters, the Flemish masters, when they would paint a still life, they would include all sorts of other objects, and so not just a couple of apples, not just you know, a couple of pieces of fruit or vegetable or whatever, it will also include, um, you know, broken bread, bits of breadcrumbs, there may be napkin servers, cutlery, utensils, that kind of stuff in the background or within the composition. Here it looks to me, you've got to a stage where it actually needs, it needs a little bit of extra just to add the finishing touches. Uh, and it's almost like, you know, a, an advertising or commercial photographer, you know, photographing something. And then with tweezers, they will then add in grape seeds or they will put in little flecks of something just to add a little bit of authenticity I suppose to the scene. I think what I'm trying to say is the scene is a little bit too clean um, and it needs to be broken down a little bit more. The lighting on the left and the right hand side of the bottle is pretty good. The right hand side is a little bit hotter than the left hand side um, and I don't know if that's deliberate or not. It kind of works. I would probably go dimmer on the left hand side well I'd go dimmer on both of them actually so that it's not quite so hot on the right hand side but it's a little bit more understated on the left hand side uh, you've done also a very good job of keeping the wine level let's say this may be a sort of commercial uh, uh, little commercial um, job uh, you've you've done the business of getting the color of the wine coming through quite nicely I'm assuming that's a reasonably realistic color uh, plus uh, the label is nice and clear so we know exactly whose it is and what it is and uh, in fact I'm getting thirsty looking at it um, so I think well done um, in, in, in something that is actually very, very difficult. Uh, what generally happens, what I see in, in other examples is when you light something like this, there's a huge danger of the object, in this case the bottle, just disappearing into the background when you use something like a jet black background. Um, and so those two side soft boxes um, and, and the speed light or whatever have done a very good job of just lifting or separating the bottle from the background. You could possibly angle a tiny bit of tin foil, a little bit of metal foil, or even a tiny little mirror just out of shot above the top of the shot to just punch in a little bit of light into where the cork is. So just on the top of the bottle, just to just to stop that disappearing into the background. It is very, very hard to do. And if you look at any commercial photographer studio, they will have box loads of little reflectors, sticky, sticky stuff that they use, and they stick all around these just to bounce little bits of extra light in. They're the messiest so-and-sos you're ever likely to see, but that's the way you do it. You just use anything you can get your hands on just to light in extra little bits of highlight here and a highlight there. But I think that's a, it's a really cracking job. The main comment would be to make it a little bit better, I think, is to add some extra elements in there, as I say. It could be it could be some cutlery. It could be like a napkin. It could be something of that nature in order just to fill some of that area in the tray on the left-hand side a bit more. Well done.